sort of been working, but um, I'm, uh, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a tech person. I, full confession, I'm a lawyer. But I'm a, a privacy and cybersecurity lawyer. I've been practicing in the field for about 20 years. So I was, I like to say I was doing privacy and cyber before they were cool. Um, and I work at a, a firm called Mintz Levin in Boston. Um, we're a, about a 700 lawyer firm. And I share our privacy and cybersecurity practice. I saw the announcement for this, this meeting that you were going to talk about Zoom and, um, and, and, privacy and security issues associated with remote work. And I've been doing a lot of work in that for the last <laughs> couple of weeks. Um, and I just, I emailed Steve, um, responded to the, the invite saying, not sure if, you know, non-tech people are invited, but I, I'm, I'm happy to participate uh, because this is, this is kind of my sweet spot and it's what I do. And I've been spending a lot of time looking at, at Zoom and teleconferencing and, and remote working issues and all of the security issues associated with them. So I'm here just to, to chat and to lend whatever um, legal issue, legal, you know, saying, you know, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer, but I've been looking at these issues for a, a while now and they've all sort of come to a, a major, uh, major head in, in the last two weeks. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Um, Steve, could you introduce yourself, Steve Provost? Hi, I'm Steve Provost. Uh, I work with Adam every Wednesday at the Get Connected Clinic. I'm a kind of a staff volunteer person. Um, been in the IT world since uh, the Commodore VIC-20, which is my first computer. And uh, boy, do I miss that computer. And um, I also am the executive director, uh, chairman of the board of the organization called Boston Project Rebound. Reentry Services here in Boston. We're a uh, uh, more of a newer um, group. We work with those coming out of the correctional system here in the Boston, Massachusetts area. And right now, serve up to uh, somewhere like 15, 16 clients right now. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Steve Eisenberg? Yes. Did you call me? Yeah. Could you introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Steve Eisenberg. I'm treasurer of the group. I've also been around in the group for quite some time. And uh, I've uh, got a background in software engineering, software quality assurance, land management. And right now I'm uh, producing videos. And this will be one of the ones that I produce. Thank you, Steve. Um, Steve Provost, uh, if you check the chat, there's a note from Martin about lighting. So okay. um, we, we have various very skilled drama, dramatists in our group who, who help people look good on Zoom. Um, Mo Hadden. Oh, great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Maurice Hadden. I've been in the tech business for, um, I don't know, 25, 30 years. Currently not in the tech business. I uh, hung up my gloves uh, about a year ago in the museum world, IT director at the ICA. And uh the topic is of interest to me, so I've been following the group for about 10 years or so, pop in and out as uh, topics uh, are of interest, and this one is indeed of interest. So, Oh, Mo, I, I, spoke, I spoke at last year's uh, a conference, legal conference, for museum administrators. Ah, wow. So it, it, it's, a, it's a, of interest to legal, to, to museum administrators, for sure, the, the whole security and um, because they're all they're they're doing so many different things with, you know, new new technologies and and how they can in, bring people into the museums virtually and otherwise. It was it was a really interesting conference. Oh, I think lately they've really lowered their security standards to allow many more people up on the platform. Yes, indeed they have. Yeah, so mm, I'm glad I'm not managing that piece at the moment. <laughs> I guess they really need to be state of the art. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you, Arthur. <laughs> um, Norm, could you introduce us and the um, athlete behind you? <laughs> sure, Adam. Uh, I'm Norm Stembridge. Um, I worked for many years in banking financial services. I knew very little about banking as I was in a world at that time called data processing. Uh, 
prior to client server and internet technology. Uh, I worked as a systems consultant and a systems analyst on large scale projects um, on the, in the mainframe environment, basically, uh, connecting to other platforms. Um, I, I'm relatively new to the group, uh, and I was interested tonight in tonight's topic, security in general. Um, you basically never have enough. Uh, it's always something that you, you want to think about it before it's too late, basically, the way I look at it. Um, the What's behind me is, as I alluded to before, is the late, great Jackie Robinson, one of the Brooklyn... Um, I'm, an, I'm a fan of the Dodger organization. That would be the Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> um, and they are, uh, they were important to me historically, culturally, socially, um, as with a lot of things in a world that just is a lot different. So that's Maybe, why. Um, I, I should note that, uh, our, we have here tonight, uh, Jeff, did you have trouble getting your camera working? Yeah, I, I do. That, that's, that's fine. If, if you need help, um, Steve, um, Martin is, has gotten really good at this stuff, so you can ask him about it. Um, so we have three, um, on, three upcoming speakers who are at the meeting tonight. So um, in May, Jeff is going to be giving a talk on Synology, which is uh, network storage, a new network storage technology. That has become increasingly relevant. Uh, Norm in June, Norm Sturmbridge, Sturmbridge will be speaking about mainframes, both then and now. Um, and in July, uh, Steve Provost um, and his coworker Mike Austin will be giving a presentation on using, uh, doing live streaming, and the issues that are connected with live streaming and uh, posting videos on YouTube and using YouTube as a platform. Uh, Glenn, could you introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Glenn Fun, and since our last meeting, I did clean my camera, so <laughs> no, no, no more haze. Um, uh, I, I've been around since 1986 when we started the group in the netware days, and um, I am retired for several years now, but I did infrastructure uh, consulting before that. Um, Glenn has, has given the many layers of networking meaning. Um, he helped found, he was the creator of this, what was then the Novell Users Group. And the way he created it was he networked with the president of Novell, who was, he was sitting at a table with him. He said, hey, we want to start a users group. And President Novell said, okay, well, we'll help you. And that was the networking that helped this networking group. Uh, Martin, can I ask you? Hi there. Um, I'm not your typical computer consultant. Um, I work one-on-one -on -one with my clients, Windows or Macintosh, and just help them learn how to use their technology better. Um, I'm very boots on the ground, you know, end user uh, support uh, in the common parlance. Um, but I have a lot, I have a blast. Um, and I'm in this crazy virus environment. I'm, I've been set up for years to help people remotely. So uh, I'm one of the, I think, very lucky people who can keep working and in fact, help people in this context um, because of this uh, situation. Um, I also um, write a free email monthly newsletter um, that I call Martin's Practical Computer Advice. Um, uh, so uh, in this past month, I wrote about using Zoom, which I'm happy, I'm happy to share the link. Um, a whole bunch of things that uh, I've learned over the past few weeks. Um, I've seen Zoom like with two people. I've seen Zoom with, uh, you know, 150 people and it's, Pretty amazing uh, how well the platform holds up, um, you know, all other things being equal. So uh, this is uh, this is cool stuff, and uh, you know, great great to see great to see uh, most of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Arthur. Yes. Hi, <clears throat> Arthur Priver. I have a company that manages computer operations for small businesses, and this is a little bit of a crazy time, as uh, can't get out to see people but just work remotely, set up remote access for people, try to uh, trouble through problems without being hands-on. And uh, it's uh, not boring yet. <laughs> Thank you. 
So, so, Arthur, so last time I talked with you, you had a problem with Microsoft and an update that kept, um, you know, basically uh, causing the computer not to restart. Have you ever resolved that issue? Okay. Uh, the Patch Tuesday update in March caused, in my world, 15 different computers to, to no longer restart. I have worked out a procedure with Microsoft. So I have two different recovery memory sticks, one for standard hard disks and one for GPT hard disks. And I have to physically place them in the computer and start over and rebuild Windows. They have never acknowledged the source of the problem as I've talked to many of the support technicians, but I have now rebuilt 13 of the 15 machines. Uh, one's behind her. It's a painful process. I definitely want to hear more about this. Thank you, Arthur. Okay. Sharif? Yes, <laughs> good evening. Yes, uh, I've been involved with this group for over a year and a half, and I've been into this field over 40 years. Currently semi-retired, active with the lot of senior group, which they have closed for a month now, and some social groups. And I enjoy learning the skill. It's never end. And I'd like to share my experiences with the with the people, whomever I can help, and glad to be with you this evening. Thank you, Sherry. Will? Will Roberts? Will, oh yes, thank you. Unmute the thing. Yeah. So, sending an author a note saying, uh, he has my condolences on rebuilding machines. I, uh, uh, I uh, spent the last uh, 24 hours uh, rebuilding a machine belonging to a friend in New York State who's in his 80s. And after we got the whole thing redone, it turns out he's completely forgotten all his passwords. <laughs> so uh, that's okay. His Gmail password has a backup mail to his AOL mail account, and he has forgotten the password to both of them. Uh, so... <clears throat> I, I I am, uh, I, I'm kind of just a network hanger on. I mean, I was briefly involved back in the early days of the internet with a uh, internet service provider, but generally my background is in business. And right now uh, my retirement career is I teach uh, part-time in the graduate program in architecture. And what I teach is I teach business uh, to would-be architects how to run a practice. Ah, wonderful. Where, where do you I, teach, Will? I teach at Mass College of Art and Design in Boston. Yep. And uh, we are now moving all of our stuff to a virtual online platform because the school is physically closed right now. Uh, I've been fortunate. I'm not teaching this term, but my entire class is built around a series of uh, PowerPoint lectures, which are generally like 200 PowerPoint slides. They're really rapid fire, so they're not they're not dull PowerPoint slides. We just go through them. I uh, give the students after each class a PDF of the entire deck of slides. All of the class is held together with a WordPress blog where their assignments get posted and where they get to comment on things and interact with one another. And all of their readings are provided as documents on the WordPress blog uh, in the WordPress blog library, uh, almost always in PDF format or sometimes video. Uh, so uh, transi transitioning this to an online environment has not been uh, particularly difficult, but uh, it, it's been interesting. John, so Harry? Uh, yes. Um, the IT roots go back to um, a job at the Draper Lab when I was an MIT undergrad on uh, Project Apollo. I've worked at Raytheon as a systems guy back in the System 360 days. I've been a, the resident IT guy for my law firm. I've been an IT consultant. I've been an IT department head for a municipality. Right now I'm teaching control systems for autonomous vehicles as a volunteer to some high school students at Nauset Regional High School here on Cape Cod. I'm otherwise retired from all of those myriad of careers. And I've been in and out of the group, but the trouble is I'm 100 miles from Boston, so getting there on a Tuesday yeah. <clears throat> is a real challenge, so this is great. Uh, yeah, this is a, a mixed blessing, isn't it? Stan? Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> on here, you can see me here, right? Yeah, we can see you now. Oh, that's, that's okay. 
Yeah, you know, a very nice ceiling. <laughs> yes, it is nice soft lighting. Um, I think we could do an ICA thing for this. Well, I modern, was, modern art. <laughs> God, I, I had invited a guy, Rich Nelly. I don't know if he's still on or not, but um, but he had, he had he puts a basically it looks like a picture in front of his camera, which is a great idea. But anyway, so I'm not a tech person. I've been in and out of tech things, uh, starting with um, Fortran in 1968 at the University of Michigan, uh, which put me off computers for a very long time. Um, and then I think in the mid-70s, late 70s, I took some computer courses at a local community college in, um, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, particularly fond of COBOL. Um, but didn't get back into it. Well, no, actually I did. I actually started with, with a Commodore 64. But what I do for a living is I write affirmative action programs for federal contractors, which involve a certain amount of number crunching and, and things like that. So that's, I'm not, I'm only a tech person in my own house or my own mind, depending on how I think about it. So Thank you, Sam. You're welcome. Um, Karen? Karen, do you want to say howdy? I unmuted myself. Hi, I'm rel relatively new, very new to most of you. Uh, I've been computers, but uh, I just recently, years ago, I got a certificate from Bunker Hill Community College in health, um, health, in, um, health information technology. Uh, but my job is not in computers right now. Uh, to get into them, I'd like to get to working with them. Uh, <coughs> if you, uh, Sorry. goes um, memory layer. Uh, hey, Karen. We can't okay. hear her. We're, we're having trouble making out what you're saying. Um, sometimes when, when you're having this problem with Zoom, we're, we're now in the meeting, so we should talk about Zoom issues. Um, it's common to have internet problems. Um, you can have slowdowns, and we're having that right now with you, Karen. But there's a remedy you could try if you wish which is if you call us on your cell phone or your home or your landline using the invitation that has a phone number, you can call in at the same time that you're still plugged into Zoom with this account. So I've been recommending because of the camera shortage, there are a lot of people who don't have cameras, but I don't want, to, I don't want them to lose the benefit of, of the full screen Zoom. There's, there's no reason why you can't watch Zoom without a camera. And if you wish, you can use your cell phone as a camera. Yep. Great. Okay. So, if, so you call, if you call in, I, I, I will in a. Yeah, take your time. So I'll, I'll talk call on someone else for now. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, Jeff. Uh, can you hear this? We can. We can see your picture. Well, the problem I'm having is that it appears to be a still picture. There's as soon You're as I. Dignified though, you look very dignified. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, my, on my side, Steve's been trying to help me, so I don't know what it takes to turn it. it, it it's like a single screenshot that just stops. But anyway, I don't know if I should try to deal with it or just give you a quick bio. and, and, and Yeah, just, in, just introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jeff Katz. So my company's Whaling City Software. I've been involved uh, with BNUG for quite a few years. Um, my business uh, spans small mom and pop companies all the way to enterprise level companies. Um, in this past year, I've done a couple of Nutanix demonstrations for the BNUG group uh, that I sell to enterprise customers. Uh, and and I'm, I've got an upcoming, I've done um, one on VPro a couple of months ago but an upcoming one on Synology NAS drives that I sell to my smallest customers. And then the in-between ones, mostly Windows uh, file server networks. Um, that's what I do. But I still can't get the camera working right. Nice to meet you and see you. Um, 
And uh, um, Suki Svoboda, uh, Kathleen Svoboda? Yeah, I'm here. Do you want to um, say something about yourself, Suki? Uh, yeah, I, I, I help people remotely with their bookkeeping. And uh, I, I'm just really interested in computers and I've been doing some landscaping also. Um, and you can't look at my picture because my eyes are streaming with some allergy. We'll imagine you. Okay. Um, and there's someone named Guishan. Are you there? I'm going to um, unmute you. Sorry. I don't know why you're muted. One second. I'm trying to unmute this person, but not in much longer. He may have he may have muted himself. Yeah, and you can't override that, right? Apparently not. Apparently not. That's a good thing to know. Okay. I think people should have the right to to muting being muted without interference. Um, Steve um, Eisenberg, could you just um a chat with him or her and find out if they, they want more attention? Yep. Um, uh, Karen, uh, have you come through on phone as well as? Um, Video. She's also self muted. Irina is joining us. I'm with you. I'm hey, with Karen. you. Hi. I have not called in. Okay. When you get to it. Um, yep. And uh, DG is muted, but I think he wants to be. I think he's got family running around. So I think we're all here and ready to roll. So I think we're going to launch into the discussion. My hopes for tonight are that we'll be able to develop a, a deeper understanding of what's going on. And the primary goal, I just want to remind people, is not to get security just right in some sort of abstract sense. Hello, Irina. Um, but uh, our, our primary goal is to um, figure out how to do our jobs well. And some of us are computer people and some of us are not. And I think in general, doing our jobs well under these extraordinary circumstances means knowing some of the hazards and pitfalls. Um, and so what I thought would be a good idea would be to open with turning to my co-host, Cynthia. Um, and Cynthia, could you um, perhaps give us an overview of the big issues that you've encountered in this, in this extraordinary couple of weeks? Uh, and maybe the advice that you've been giving your clients um, and give us a sense of what, what the big fish are. Sure, Adam, thanks. Um, this, is, this is an extraordinary time. I, I, I've been doing this work for you know, almost 20 years and I have clients and my firm itself has gone from a basically environment where things were locked down, things were controlled, things were in an environment where everyone was controlled to a week's worth of rollout to remote operations. What would ordinarily take an IT organization a month or more to roll out remote operations has been done in a week. So there will be things that, that fall through the cracks. There are, there are going to be, um, applications that are being adopted really quickly without without vetting without people taking advantage of or, or taking a, a look at what the security features are zoom has been a particular issue um, and i think the issues have only cropped up with the application uh, during the um, during this time they've gone from something like 10 million users to over 200 million users uh -huh. in a, um, oh my God. That's, yeah that's that's a phenomenal spike that's that's like hockey puck it, it, it's in, amazing it's amazing, it, yeah, that it's amazing. The whole thing so any infrastructure is going to like have issues and zoom was created as you know, an easy communications platform, an easy video conferencing platform. It did roll out to businesses and had a business application from its, its original consumer. When they went out and they went public, they, they did have a, an enterprise 
function. But not everyone started adopting that in this last week. They're like logging on to the free stuff and grabbing it and this and that. Um, there, are, there are some serious privacy and security issues with, with Zoom that, that businesses need to consider. I, I mean, general users of Zoom don't need to consider it. You know, if you're having a Zoom social hour, um, I connect with friends now on a regular basis over Zoom. We have happy hour. That's great. I don't care about privacy issues for that. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. And it doesn't matter to my friends. That's not a concern. However, when I connect with clients, when we are doing, when we're conducting board meetings, when we're having meetings, imparting confidential information, that's a, that's a very different category. Realize that under the Zoom, um, the, the, the um, application, uh, the host has um, certain powers, if you will, that are not disclosed to the users on the other side. So if, if I'm conducting, if, if I'm participating, if I'm opposing counsel, for example, participating in a Zoom meeting, negotiating, um, I may not realize that certain things relating to Zoom are happening. For example, meetings can be recorded without the participants' knowledge. Um, this meeting so happens, we were informed that the meeting's being recorded. And it, we see the little recording up in the corner. There, not every um, application of Zoom will display that recording mm. in the corner. So it can be recorded without the knowledge of the participants. Written can, transcripts. Can, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, is it legal? Um, so if you're running a Zoom meeting and you invite people to it, yeah. are you required to disclose to them that you're recording? You should, yeah, depending on where your participants are, and it varies from state to state. There are there are 50 different, you know, states have different um wiretapping laws that govern recordings of either audio or video recordings. And this is considered an audio recording. Um, and Massachusetts still happens. It's a Massachusetts is what considered to be a one party state. So if you basically consent to recording the meeting, that's okay. Everybody's deemed to be recording the meeting. Um, but there are other states, New York, California, New Jersey, um, other states that are two party states. So you need to consider where your people are as to whether you're going to, whether you need legally to inform them that you're recording the meeting, whether it's, it's automatic or not. It doesn't matter that the application is automatically recording the meeting, which is what happens with some Zoom applications. You don't have to opt into recording. It automatically records it. Uh, but legally, you could be liable for recording a meeting illegally. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. Um, also, written transcripts are available to the hosts of the meetings. Again, without any participant's knowledge of the fact that these transcripts are, are available. Um, uh, Cynthia, can I, I just want to ask a question and then make an announcement. So my question is, is the transcript done by artificial intelligence or is there a, a person? I, yeah, I believe so. That's amazing. I don't think there's an actual... I, and that's a really good question, Adam. I don't actually know if there's someone transcribing or if it's AI. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's AI. It so, is. Uh, it, it is done automatically by the machine, and it takes a while for it to come out, and it does a so-so job. Okay. Thank you. So I just want to – we have a mechanical issue here. Um, Steve Eisenberg, our co-host, has um, muted everyone in order to uh, make sure that the camera is focused on the speaker. But that's not, that doesn't mean that you need to be mute. So if you want to say something, raise your hand. I'm going to be watching carefully. Um, and um, I'll interrupt the speaker and call you. Martin, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, quick question about, about the recording aspect, the disclosure. Um, uh, so Adam announced that this meeting was being recorded, but people are joining all evening. So apart from on my screen in my upper right, it says there's a red button that says recording. Yep. But 
I might not notice that. Oh, there's a lot on the screen. <laughs> um, so what about people who don't notice a thing on the screen or come in after the announcement? Should Adam repeat that every 10 minutes? The only people who will be recorded, the only images of people who will be recorded are those that have their camera turned on and who speak. If you don't speak or you have your camera turned off, then your image will not be recorded. Well, I understand, but if I'm going to participate, I, you know, I'm just saying the disclosure as opposed to, I get what's, what could be recorded. I'm just talking about the disclosure of. I would recommend if, if uh, when I have clients participating in a long meeting that people are joining randomly, people are hopping in and out of the meeting, I recommend that every so often someone announce that the meeting is being recorded. Um, just for, as lawyers like to say, belt and suspenders purposes, um, you know, Chances are most people see the the recording button in the corner in the upper upper left hand corner or right hand depending on your screen. Um, but you know it, it never hurts to just say just a reminder this meeting's being recorded. Just okay. a reminder this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Steve Provost had a question. Yeah, I just noticed that when um, see well when it was mentioned that we we're recording this particular um, program. I noticed that I went down to click on the record button myself and only at this point, only the host or the co-host being Steve are the only ones allowed to uh, actually record. Now, what if somebody yeah. else in the group want to record they you know, just for their own, public, their own public use? No, they cannot. Well, they cannot. actually, I, I'm gonna differ um, with you, Cynthia. So you're right, within the Zoom application, they can't. But here's the bad news about computers. The moment a bit or a pixel or a character or anything else appears on your screen, you own it. This is what makes privacy the laws and copyright laws go completely bananas with computers. So right now, it's true that, um, suppose I'm not the host. If I want to use a recording program on my computer to record every cover, every single word of this meeting and every image, um, I can do it. Um, so it's really important to remember that, that once you go public, once you have a meeting where people you don't know are involved in the meeting and you can't control their behavior, you're essentially consenting in practice to allowing recording to happen. Cynthia, so, does that make sense to you? No. Um, actually, it, it well, it, it makes sense from the technology perspective, from a legal perspective, that would be completely, and if, if, I if we were having a meeting um, and we were on opposing sides and there were, there were things being negotiated and someone were recording against, um, without consent, yes. and then decided to use that against the other side for, disclosure of trade secrets or whatever in a out of what would have ordinarily been a confidential meeting i i i take that to court any day and i would win uh-huh yes and i think this is where there's a big difference between legal legal procedure and rights and practical rights um, so people should just bear in mind as they're using this technology um that um if you're if you're a lawyer, you're bound by a whole bunch of strictures that other people aren't bound by. And so if you're out in the world doing Zoom, for example, sharing your great idea um, that yes. you don't want to be stolen, yes. by the time the cops show up, you're in trouble. So it's just really important to, to remember this technology opens up doors that we haven't really thought about. Another door is the chat function lots of lots of people think chat within an app like you know private messaging or or direct messaging is direct in between participants to the chat within zoom i i could chat with any number of the participants here um and and it would be as between me and another participant it would not show up on the screen except the hosts all will get the record of that. Those chats oh, are not, yeah. the, the host can save all chat conversations. Um, whether they're the host or whether they're, they're individual to individual. 
Um, Steve uh, Provost, did you have another question? Yeah, uh, Martin was just mentioning a comment. Some good stuff. Um, take a look at that for a second, Adam. Uh, I'm just noticing also Steve Eisenberg has a sign up saying this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> That's great. I can't barely read his, uh, you can't barely see it. Uh, Steve says Steve, there's Don't, don't hold it so close to the camera, pull back. Uh, Steve, Steve, pull back. What's that? Steve is holding the sign too close to his camera. Oh yeah, Steve. Um, so, um, so Steve says there's an option you can set in your Zoom account. Um, where um, the, it says the meeting, it says automatically when you connect that the meeting's being recorded. That seems like a great option if you're doing a recording. Uh, um, good, thank yeah. you, thank you. Uh, uh, Sid, did you want to say some more about some of the deal, some of the stuff you, you've been dealing with? Yeah, we've we've been seeing we've been seeing a lot of um, with respect to video conferencing technologies. We've, um, I've been working with a number of school systems um, for whom Zoom is, Steve, you don't have to put that up the whole time, uh, for, for whom Zoom has been the, um, the video conferencing platform of choice um, because it's, it's easy, it's accessible, um, it works well, uh, but it's also, um, they've, they've had issues with, you've probably all heard about Zoom bombing, um, that, that there have been serious issues with respect to, um, to hackers. And they're not really hackers. Uh, you know, folks are, folks are publishing Zoom links to, um, to classes, to meetings, to, you know, meetups, to whatevers within, um, within Instagram within WhatsApp posts, within, within basically public posts. And that's where the Zoom bombing is occurring. It's not really, it's not really people hacking into Zoom, um, Zoom environments. It's when people publish the links to their Zoom meetings that someone else is saying, oh, look, a Zoom meeting, I'm, I'm coming on in. And the Zoom meeting has no password, there's no user IDs, there's no waiting room to, uh, which Zoom allows you to set up a waiting room so that you can vet people before they come into your meeting. Um, it's just people hopping onto your meeting, doing all kinds of crazy and, and unwanted and very nasty things. Um, and that, that has been a huge problem. And the, the FBI has been reporting on that and sent out several warnings about it. Thank you. Um, Irina, do you have a question? You'll have to unmute. Uh, can Irina unmute herself, Steve, or do I have to do it? I have to do it. Um, hi, everyone. I wanted to note one thing which I personally noticed the first time um, I participated in a Zoom meeting. Um, I was amazed by the ease with which you turned on my camera, even though I knew that it had been turned off by myself. Because it is, um, it is a security issue, you know, maybe I'm, uh, I'm a bit exaggerating, but I was amazed uh, how easily you turned on my camera. Um, in these terms, I'm not saying it in a bad sense, but it is um, an application which is using some of the hacking capabilities. Because, um, you know, as a, as a computer professional who knows a little bit about networking, ports, security, and stuff like that, I'm aware of the um, importance of certain ports in the computers. Okay. And um, that's what uh, surprised me. I, I think that I find that using this technology has been a surprise to all of us. There have been all kinds of unexpected, weird things that, that uh, just in my own experience, as you see my extremely polished presentation here, um, changing from being somebody who generally appears by voice in the outside world 
um, to being somebody who appears in person and where there's a microphone in my office rather than a telephone headset that I'm very comfortable with. I've used for 20 years. I know all about how to turn it off, how to mute it. I'm now in this new environment. And I think what Cynthia is describing is this very large law firm that has long standing rules and long standing traditions. Uh, are, we're suddenly just, we're, we're, we're tossed into this environment. Um, and it's, it, uh, it is genuinely scary. I think, I think uh, one of the things I urge people to do is think about, and I think this is generally good security advice, think about the core issues, the thing that matters to you the most. So for me, one of them is I'm, I'm in a computer practice and confidentiality is very, very important to, my, to what I do for a living. Um, it would be a real disaster if I found myself unexpectedly in a Zoom meeting talking about something that I'm not allowed to talk about or shouldn't be talking about. And yet the possibility of that has greatly been greatly increased over the last two weeks of me making a mistake like that. And so what I urge people to do is think about routines that significantly cut into that kind of risk. So for example, in my case, I have a detachable microphone camera. When I'm not using it explicitly, it's out, it's unplugged. It's a good security practice and it makes it much less likely I'm gonna do something bad. And so you might wanna think about uh, you, with a camera that's uh, embedded in a machine, uh, you can simply cover it. Cover. A lot of people do. Uh, Cynthia, do you want to? I have duct tape. <laughs> duct tape, yes. Um, they're, they're, but here's the um, advice that I want to focus on for a moment, um, since this session is about security, but it's also Passover. Um, and we were talking at the beginning of the meeting about, uh, for people who aren't familiar with it, um, because of uh, the Jews escaping from Egypt so quickly, they didn't have time for the bread to rise. We Jews have developed this long, long tradition of never eating any risen bread during the Passover week. So um, if you're strict about this, your job is to clean your house, really clean your house. I, you're supposed to take a candle and a feather and go to every corner of your house and make sure that there's not a shred of leavened bread. You're supposed to give all your bread away. Um, you're not supposed to have any leavened bread in the house and so I was talking with one of my friends who's Orthodox, and he said, well, the ancient rabbis didn't worry about what would happen if a mouse went from another house and brought leavened bread into your house. And he grinned at me wickedly, and he said, this gives you some idea of what they do worry about. The, the fact is that when you're, when you're dealing with security, there's an in, innumerable number of issues you can worry about. There's innumerable places where people can intrude. When you make changes, big changes in your technology, as Ms. Levin has, um, as our company has, as many of you have, there are many, many different issues. And in my opinion, one of the core jobs of good security is to know the difference between a big issue and a small issue. And it's not always obvious what that is, but, it's, but I urge you all to prioritize, to ask yourself, what is really bad to me? And what is, eh, that's a drag, but not a big deal. And on the stuff that's a big deal, put your energy and money and time in, into it and address it promptly. And the other stuff you can do over time. Cynthia, do you want to say more? Um, yeah, one of the one of the things um, that that we're finding that you know, especially that was that was a great analogy, Adam, to to have in, have people focus on. What are the big issues? Right now, no one can focus on what are the big issues because everything's a big issue. <laughs> everything's a big issue. Um, you know, what I'm trying to, to encourage clients in, in using all of the remote issues is, to, is to, to encourage them to communicate with their employees on a regular basis, not just about, because they're not communicating, they need to communicate with employees about all the other stuff, but to also communicate about security issues, the basics, basic, what I'm calling technical hygiene. Um, you know, patching your software is like washing your hands. Not clicking on links is like not touching your face. Communicate it to, to folks in those terms and people will understand. People will say, oh, right, maybe I shouldn't just because it's a, a COVID-19 alert, click on the links there that, that tell me something. Maybe I should think twice about 
getting an email from the CEO at two o'clock in the morning asking me to make a wire transfer. Yeah, you know, would the CEO send you an email? Maybe, probably not. In these times, people think twice, people should think twice about it. And those are the kinds of, those are the basics that I'm kind of encouraging clients to think about because nobody's going to think about redoing security systems right now because nobody wants to break things. Um, Harry had a question for you, Cynthia. Yes. Uh, in the educational environment, we sure. are dealing with minors and there are two issues that concern me. One of them is uh, securing effective consent. And the second one is uh, whether Zoom uh, limits their use of information obtained from minors. There good questions, Harry. Okay. Really good questions. Um, in the educational environment, most distance learning or most online learning is covered because the school is operating in loco parentis. So they can, they can ask students to utilize online educational tools. Um, and if, if the school has entered into a terms of use with the provider of them. Um, so that's one thing. Zoom, however, Zoom is not, um, their privacy policy is a little bit kludgy in whether or not they agree not to use the personal information for, for marketing purposes or for, you know, to gather information about I don't know. I, I haven't seen a lot of schools lately using Zoom and those school systems that have been using it. For example, the New York Department of Education today dropped Zoom. Um, you know, a lot of my clients are using Microsoft Teams or Google. Um, they're using their, their Google communication, their, their Google Meet as part of their Google for Education suite. Hey, Cynthia. Um, yeah. Could, could you say a few words in Arena? You're, you're going to be next. Uh, could you say just expand on that a little bit? They dropped Zoom in yes. favor for Microsoft Teams and Google. I haven't heard of people meeting that way. What what's that like for the general? Is that available to the general public? Those options? No, no, and that's that's the whole issue, Adam. It's it's available to the school systems under their agreements with the the tech companies. So they've got a they've got a blanket agreement with Microsoft. Microsoft Teams is available if you have Microsoft Office three sixty five forever, for example. Um, Teams is available. If your school system, and a lot of school systems use Google Education Suite. Um, they use Google Docs, they use, they use G Suite, they use a lot of different Google applications. Google Meet is a closed environment. It's not like Google Hangouts. It's a different environment for collaboration. And it's part of the Google User Suite if you are a Google user, a Google Suite user, not not just a general Gmail user. Uh, Cynthia, is, do they have a, a similar kind of technology to Zoom? Yes. Yes. Yeah. They do. Getting a bit of an echo there. Um, the, the collaboration tools are good. They're they're easily usable. It's just that they're not they're not consumer grade. They're kind of not they don't have the background stuff. They don't have the fun stuff going on. Um, they're they're straightforward, they're secure, they've got, they've got better security issues. You know, they don't do things like, you know, Zoom issues everyone a personal ID when you go to sign up for Zoom. And most people use their personal meeting ID for every meeting they have. Well, if you know my personal Zoom meeting ID and I use that for every meeting I have, you can pop into whatever meeting I have. You can pop into my personal meeting at any time. That might be really inconvenient. Uh, Irina, do you have a question? Hold on, I have to, I have to unmute you, Irina. Hold on a second. Oh, thank you, Steve. Steve, could you unmute her? Yeah. Hold on, Irina. We almost have you. Go ahead. Say something. Yes. Sorry. Hold on a second. I'm sorry, Irina. Hold on a second. Try it now. Yes, Adam. Since this is a technical networking group, I would like um, to ask you this question. And um, I would like to get a clear understanding of this um, issue. 
you see, it's not only the camera, the built-in camera that exists. In some cases, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, the whole screen, the whole computer screen can be used as a camera. Am I right? Does anyone know anything about this? I've never heard Yes, that. I would like to, because, you know, ignorance is bliss. Hold, hold on uh, to that, that thought for a moment. Does anyone have, know something about this, Jeff? Is there anyone who, raise your hand if you know something about this. Does anyone know about Are you saying, Irina, that the screen that you're looking at I'm is something that can sure, be used as a camera? Yes, I'm pretty sure that I have read about it. Um, I haven't got into this because it wasn't my area of concentration. But I'm sure that I have seen it. Hold on, and, hold on, Irina. Um, Martin? Um, if we're talking about Zoom, uh, I think what you're referring to sounds like what's called screen sharing, where I can transmit to the meeting either a window of my choice or my entire computer screen. But I don't know of any way that my screen can be turned into a camera to look at me. So which are we talking about? Yes, I think you're and I'm not sure. And you know, ignorance uh, breeds fear. And I would like to understand if that can be true. I, it would be really astonishing just knowing what cam what monitor technology is, Irina, and a lot of us have dealt with the monitors through the ages. Yeah. I, in my entire career, I've never heard of that being done. Four seven nine. Uh, Drew, do you want to say something? Uh, on the um, on the issue of the screen, I understand that you can share your screen, which is fine. But one of the issues is people will have a bunch of windows open in their screen and they will not be, they will have over in the side showing part of a window they're not intending to share. So they're sharing pieces of email or confidential material that they don't mean to share. So if you're going to share your screen, make sure the only thing on your screen is what you want to share. A uh, really important part. Martin, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, uh, Will, um, you may not be aware, but when you click screen sharing, you can't in this meeting because Adam disabled it. Um, it immediately asks you, do you want to share one window of your choice or do you want to share your entire screen? So I think there's an encouragement there to, um, most of the time it's one window, you know, this spreadsheet or that document. So I, th th that is visible as you click this. It asks you before it goes ahead and shares. I, 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 understand, I understand that, but with but, the users, as they say, uh, if you make something idiot-proof, you'll build a better idiot. <laughs> oh, so yeah, this is all about education. Make sure the people in your office are aware of that. It, it's a huge issue, and, and the, there's so many subtle, subtle issues involved that a lot of us who are in the educational part of the computer world, when we try to do some education involving our, our computers, the risk of revealing something goes way, way up. Like, you have all this stuff, and the... the the potent, and one of the problems with the net is that because of the Wayback Machine and other sorts of recordings, you can make one mistake, and even though you say, oh, I, oh my God, that shouldn't be out there, and you bring it back, it may not be bringing back of it. Um, Cynthia, do you want to say some, some more about, about your consulting and the clients you've Yeah, with? And, and what Will just said is a really important point, because one of the things that we that was in the title of tonight's meeting was... 201 CMR 17, that is a near and dear line of, you know, a citation to any of us who do privacy and security work in the state of Massachusetts. Um, the fact that Will's, Will's statement was, it, it just raised the hair on the back of my neck because in, in Massachusetts, if you are in a meeting and you display a screen you share a screen that, for example, has a list of your employees and their social security numbers to a meeting that are not authorized to see those names and social security numbers, that could be a security breach under Massachusetts law. And that could be reportable to the attorney general's office under 201 CMR 17. Is everyone familiar with this law? Is this new? So just a, a quick word for people who aren't. In 2010, some guy sat in a parking lot of the TJ Maxx, one of the TJ Maxx stores, and committed the largest theft in human history. 
He collected social security numbers. He collected bank account numbers. He collected lots and lots and lots of stuff. So this was a disaster, a huge embarrassment for the IT staff. I'm really glad I was not working for TJ Maxx at the time. Um, but the Massachusetts legislature's response was, was with the normal bluntness of the Massachusetts character, was my 14-year-old nephew could have secured that network better than your Fortune 500 IT department did. And so they passed the strictest data safety law in the country. They called it 201 CMR 17. Um, and the, the law applies to every business in Massachusetts. And I actually wrote an article about it called What Law? Because lots and lots of people still, to this day, are not compliant with this regulation. Oh, no. Um, and it basically says if you run a business in Massachusetts and you do a single transaction with someone in the Commonwealth, you have to have a written security plan. And in most other states, these laws are basically say, do what you're supposed to do. If you don't understand what you're supposed to do, read the case law. But Massachusetts is an educational state. We like teaching people things. So when they created this law, the guy who created it, he was taxed with doing this by the legislature and he was a lawyer. And he went downstairs and grabbed his IT guy and he said, we have to create these regulations. What should we do? And this is a good IT guy. And they made 77, it's like 77 requirements that you need to follow and you need to write it down. You need to say that you're doing it. It was really amazing accomplishment. It had only one serious problem. It was really well done. But you should be aware that if you're doing business with people, you have to comply with this law and the law has serious teeth. It's tied to the fraud statute. So, in the example that Cynthia gave, suppose I was at a meeting um, where we're having some kind of personnel meeting and we do it on Zoom because everyone's gone home, right? So we're having this Zoom meeting because we have to talk about this issue. And I open up my laptop and share my screen and it has every all the staff social security numbers on it. I could be fined $5,000 for each social security number that got breached. And I could be put out of business. It's a really, really serious matter. And it's one that I think this new situation introduces all kinds of wonderful opportunities. Cynthia, do you want to say more? Yeah, be, and it's not just Massachusetts. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm referencing Massachusetts only because that's where we are. But there are also, you know, there are 49 other states that have data breach notification laws now, most of which relate to unauthorized access to things like social security numbers. It, it's not like someone has to steal them. It's just that someone unauthorized has access and viewing is access. So if you inadvertently display stuff on a screen in a Zoom chat, in a Zoom meeting, that could, it could be a breach of multiple state data breach notification laws. So you could get fined by all the different states. Yeah. Yeah, or you'd have to call me. <laughs> and what would you do in that situation? Um, we do an investigation. We figure out what states. We determine what notices are required um, because you may not, you, you may need to send notices to all the individuals. You know, in Massachusetts, if their social security numbers displayed, you need to provide them with 18 months of credit monitoring. It's... It's, it can be a very expensive mistake. And has this been rigorously enforced in your experience, these, these um, new laws? It, uh, there hasn't been, it, there have been plenty of um, class action suits. Plaintiff's lawyers like to, to try and enforce this and take companies to court and you know, sue them and settle for, for millions and millions of dollars. Um, which the people whose social security numbers or credit card information has been compromised get practically nothing. Um, states themselves tend, they, they just get them and they say, thank you very much. We're glad you, we're glad you complied. Uh, and if they find out later that you didn't comply, yes, they're being enforced. Um, Massachusetts has been, they, they launch investigations. I, I confer with the attorney general's office, you know, probably once or twice a month. Um, and they are, they want you to report it. Um, if they find out that something happened and you didn't report it, they will be less than pleased. And they do um, launch investigations and the investigations can be very expensive. 
Um, California is, you know, we've got the, the whole California problem now with the new California law. Um, you said a few words about it. I don't think most of us have heard of that. Yeah, that's California enacted a, a consumer privacy law called the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, it was enacted uh, at the end of 2018. It, it took effect, um, at end of 2019, it took effect in January, as of January 1st. It is the, a, Massachusetts used to be the toughest. California is now the toughest consumer privacy law in the United States. If, if your company or if, if clients are doing business in California, um, it, it behooves you to pay attention to it. Um, there, are, there are real teeth to it for breaches, which is a, what's called a private right of action, which means anybody can sue you doesn't mean the attorney general's office can sue you. It means anybody can sue you. Any individual can get together a class in California uh, and, and sue you for a, a breach of this law. Um, it's, it's very restrictive uh, and, and it's, it's very consumer friendly, which is not a bad thing. It just means that, that businesses need to take, businesses doing business in California, which is, many people since California has the fourth largest economy in the world. Um, it, it means that, that people need to take that seriously and take consumer privacy and consumer issues seriously. Can, can you have some um, idea, um, Cynthia, of, of the, the, in broad strokes, what this, what's different about what they're doing in California than what we do here? Uh, in broad strokes, it's a very um, it's a very broad consumer rights act, um, which means that you have the right to have access. If you're a California consumer that's covered by this in a with a business that's covered by this law, you have a right to request uh, a copy of all the information they collect on you. You have a wow. right, yeah, yeah, for the last twelve months. There, um, it's it's not quite like Europe, where basically under the European general data protection regulation, you can basically request everything they've ever collected on you till the beginning of time. Um, California is, is for the prior 12 months, but you can, you have the right to know, you have the right to, um, uh, re you have the right to delete. So it means you can contact a company and say, delete everything you have on me. I don't want to ever, it's not just I, that I don't want to hear from you again, delete everything you've ever collected on me. So can they do that with Transparium and Equifax? Can they just go to those credit reporting companies that collect all that data uh, and say- Unfortunately, no, the credit reporting companies are kind of exempt from it. That's the big loophole in it. How'd they do that? <laughs> Lobbying. <laughs> it's called lobbyists. Uh-huh. Yeah. I just want to interrupt for, for a couple of moments. Um, Someone's um, logged in with 733-7205. Uh, um, and we'll unmute you if you want to. Is that you, Karen? Great. Um, thank you. Okay, so, so um, Karen, I'm going to rename that number just so we know who you are. Um, Jeff asked about the 18 months of credit monitoring. Yeah, y you know, it, it's, it's kind of, I think it's kind of a, a bone. Um, to, to throw out to people, there's, you know, what can you do? For, in reality, most of us have been implicated by major, major breaches in, in the last three or four years. Um, if, if any of us, if you have a Capital One, if you had any, any dealings with the federal government where you were involved in the OMB breach, if you had an Anthem insurance policy, it, you know, go on and on. Um, that's 18 months of credit monitoring doesn't do a whole lot. Credit monitoring, in my view, doesn't do a whole lot anyway. Um, you know, it's, it's, that's, Can you say that's a bit more about that? Barn. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the horse is already out of the barn at that point. Uh, uh, Cynthia, could you, um, Steve, did you have a question? See you, Provost. Yeah. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Cynthia, I'm wondering if um, if this particular uh, law that you're talking about, does it also uh, go across the board with the HIPAA laws that uh, a lot of organizations like nonprofits are uh, already have on the books? Yeah, um, that's a good question, Steve. It, it doesn't, it, it 
has an exemption for HIPAA covered entities, but it's really narrow and it does apply to nonprofits. Uh, so I'm going to interrupt for a moment. It's about 7:45, um, and uh, part of the part of our obligation in this meeting is we um, need to nominate officers for our group. Um, and so we're going to just take a few minutes and take care of that business. It doesn't need to be long. We've got a lot more to talk about. Uh, so the, we're a nonprofit. Um, we are bound by 201 CMR 17. Um, and we're also, because we're a nonprofit, we have um, a board structure that's required in order to be an organization in Massachusetts. Um, and there's a, the required positions, and Steve Eisenberg knows much more about this than I do, is you have to have a president, you um, have to have a treasurer. I think a secretary is optional, is that right, Steve? We don't know, maybe. Secretary is um, optional. Secretary's option. We have a lawyer here. Thank you so much. Yeah, secretary's option. <laughs> okay. So um, what's really important is that we uh, nominate and then eventually elect a president and a secretary. But in addition, um, we are a um, organization that wants to grow and gr grow stronger. We have a real mission of improving education about computers in our community. And it's an underserved area. As, as everyone knows, user, users groups have fallen on hard times. Um, and I'm really, I think a lot of us really want to grow this very old group um, and welcome more particularly younger people into this group so that uh, we can continue what we're doing and have, have us grow and change. For that, we need more than just a president and a secretary and a treasurer. We really need, um, other people in the group to step forward and participate in, Amazon, in growing yeah. the group. Amazon, so yeah. I'm going to propose that in addition to uh, president and treasurer, that we also have um, a position, and it can be several people, of outreach coordinator. I think um, the kind of outreach I'm thinking of is outreach for speakers, outreach for new members, outreach to the community to do community activities to let them know about us. And now, you know, this Zoom thing is a mixed blessing. The Zoom world we're in and the fact that we can't meet in person is sad. But I will point out that the uh, attendance at this meeting is at least as high as in, in a regular meeting. And we have people from Florida and people from places who could not otherwise attend Cape Cod and for places where, where it's really hard for people to come. Um, and so we actually have an opportunity during the pandemic to perhaps strengthen our group, reach out to more people, doesn't mean we're gonna give up on meeting in person, which I think is essential, but it means that we can have other educational programs. So I'm gonna propose um, two new positions, uh, an outreach coordinator, which can be a multi-person position, um, and a uh, development planner, somebody who will think about how to grow our programs. So I'm going to throw the floor open to nominations for these positions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show everyone the Zoom share screen here. Zoom has a whiteboard, which in some ways avoids some of the confidentiality issues. It's kind of a nuisance, but it avoids having to actually share your own screen. Um, uh, the reason why I find it a nuisance is that um, I probably need to learn more about it. I think it does have a text toolbar, uh, but I haven't quite gotten the handle on it, so bear with me. So I'm in the whiteboard. Can everyone see the whiteboard? Yeah. Yes. I'm trying to get a text box. Any advice would be, I'd be grateful. Why are you using the whiteboard? What is your purpose? Uh, I, want to, I want to type something for people to see. You and I think it that? has a, a menu. Uh, hold on, uh, I'm in the whiteboard. It, I think it has a, a way of, I've done this before. Oh, here it is. If you click on the whiteboard button, you get a text box. And then you can say things like, <clears throat> it, it, the, the whiteboard really needs uh, some modifications to it so that I'd like to see it act more as a, uh, like, like Microsoft Office Word does. Well, I'll tell you my technique for dealing with this. I'm going to stop sharing this for a moment. And I'm going to go out of my full screen Zoom mode and shrink Zoom for a moment and make sure that my, my, my screen is respectable. Um, 
meaning that I'm going to open up a Word document to cover the full screen to make it a little bit harder for people to intrude. Um, and then I'm going to go back to Zoom. Hold on a second. Oh, there it is. Zoom turned into a little box up there. And I'm going to share my screen. And what I'm going to do is share this, uh, this Word document. Can everyone see it? Mm -hmm. Yep. So now I get to use Microsoft Word. And for those of you who do a lot with PDFs, uh, we teach a Spanish class once a week. My coworker and I teach a Spanish class to little kids. And we wanted to share with them the, um, the text, the book we're reading. Um, so we found this uh, really remarkable way of doing that. Um, so if I'm going to do my share again, one sec. I'm going to share screen. And I'm going to open up this book. This book is a PDF that we have a right to use in our class. We're using it now just for demonstration. But we use this very inexpensive program called Qt PDF. And Qt PDF allows you to type in a PDF. So, for example, I, I photographed this book. Again, we, we just we have a lawyer in the room, so I'm just going to explain our copyright situation. We bought enough copies to cover the people in the class. And we're now using it online because of the emergency. We're not stealing these people's intellectual property. Uh, this is a wonderful book um, called Radio Man about it's this little boy. Um, so it's about a little boy named Diego. And he, um, uh, he, he's a migrant farm worker. And it's about him and his, life, his family's life. Uh, and it's a bilingual book. But what I want to point out to people is that very often when you're at a meeting, you'll have a PDF you want to talk about it with people. And I see that Zoom has some kind of annotate feature, but this is much more sophisticated. This was designed to allow you to type in a PDF. So when I'm trying to explain what say this metaphor means, that's Spanish for woke himself up. And you can then, if you wish, save the document so your notes are being saved. So I just, in response to Steve Provost's question, you can actually make the full use of the full armamentarium of your computer, including PowerPoint, you name it, Access, Oracle. You can display it in your share and use it um, for your audience. Um, and you can have other people share as long as you have some control over who's in your meeting so you don't get bombed. So I'm gonna go back to that Word document. And you can see it's pretty easy to switch back and forth and reasonably safe. You can't see the rest of my computer right now you can notice that I use Dropbox. Um, you, you see my toolbar, and that might give something away, but not a whole lot. So, um, so here, um, I want to just talk about officers here. And um, so one place where you will be revealing is if you do a save as, you'll reveal your directory structure. Um, so you may want to you may want to do that with care. Um, I would probably just make a new folder here for Vina. Rabbit files. What's that, Steve? Rabbit. Did someone say something? Rabbit. Oh, you're files. running about the rabbit. You're running about the rabbit. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, so here I am. Um, and what I want to do is I want to talk about officers. So we have uh, president, which is the role I'm fulfilling now. Treasurer, which is the role that Steve is um, fulfilling now. Um, and then we have outreach coordinators and development planning. So um, the procedure here is just to ask, if you want to nominate someone for this position, I'll put them for a position. I'm going to nominate Steve Eisenberg, who said that he wants to continue as treasurer, and he's done a magnificent job. Uh, we're really lucky to, to have him. Um, what I'm going to do is open up my um, open up my uh, my full screen here, so I can see everyone. Hold on a sec. My screen is shrunk, so I can do the share. But I'm going to now open up, so I can see people. I nominate. Um, so if you nominate. want to nominate somebody, just raise your hand. Uh, Steve Provost. I nominate Adam Frost for president. 
I accept the nomination with pleasure. I've really enjoyed being president of this group. Um, and maybe even president of the United States, we need him. It's well, let's, not get let's not get political here. Uh, let's not go there. <laughs> we're not, we're a 5013C. <laughs> um, uh, other nominations? You don't need seconding? Martin, uh, I don't think we need seconding unless that's, um, Cynthia, do you know the uh, rules of order here? Can I second both nominations? Yeah, if you're following the nominations, Robert's rules, the nominations. You need I'm sorry, Cynthia? If you're following Robert's rules, you need a second. Uh, these are both in second, so they're, they're both official nominations. Other nominations for, for either those positions or volunteering, you can nominate yourself for the other positions. Um, Adam? Yeah. Uh, technically, we do have uh, the positions of a vice president and a, uh, a secretary. Uh, we may not fill those, them, but we ought, to, we ought to include those as officers. I'll, I'll include them. Yeah. Um, being vice president is like being in a house with no furniture. <laughs> um, actually, if we had a vice president and I were president, I would be greatly treasured. Um, hold on a sec. I'm having window problems here. Oops. Um, so we have vice president and secretary. Um, any nominations for vice president? You can self-nominate as well if you wish. If you're interested in being vice president or secretary. Uh, being vice president is a good way to be involved in the uh, board meetings, learn more about the way the group has uh, been running, and uh, to be able to uh, help out um, when helping out is needed. And it's not a not a uh, time-intensive position. And if those of us who are computer people know the importance of having backups, so the vice president is like having a good backup. Mm -hmm. um, if, are there anyone here? Um, I know I want to nominate Steve Provost to be in, uh, one of the outreach coordinators. Mm -hmm. um, Steve's really enthusiastic about the group and also is really good at talking with people who he hasn't met before. And telling them about stuff, and I think it would be a really good role for you. Um, I other, guess that. Are there other people? Um, and uh, would someone like to second that nomination? I second. Sure. I'll second. That's second. Thank you. And uh, then, um, any volunteers to be involved in outreach and development? Mm -hmm. We don't have to decide today, but I, I want to urge you to think about it. It's actually, to, if I can um, play on your crass self-interest, um, representing this group is a wonderful thing um, because you'll get to meet people who otherwise would not give you the time of day. Uh, when you call people and tell them that you're from this group, I found that people are quite interested in hearing. Um, and so it's a really nice way of getting around and meeting people and getting your name and um, your work out, out in front of people. Um, good enough. So I think we, we it, so please think about it. Let me know if you're interested in being involved in that way, in being an outreach coordinator or help planning the group, which I think is a really underserved area in this group where we do good long-term planning. And I think it would also be really good practice for people to do. Hey, so Adam, think, yes. Uh, this is Marty CV. I'm um, hey, here with, uh, with my daughter, who's uh, a student at, uh, at Wentworth studying IT. Yes. Hello there. She would, she would be interested in being an outreach coordinator if you want to make get more younger people involved. We'd love to. What's your name? Uh, my name's Lauren, and then same last name. Yeah. Lauren Seeding? Yeah. Um, so, Lauren, um, at the end of the meeting, I'm going to leave the meeting on for a bit, and I'll get your information. Okay. But we're going to nominate you as outreach coordinator. Your dad has nominated you, and um, um, and I second. Okay. Am I, am I spelling it right? Yes. Um, Great. I um, my daughter goes to high school around the corner from Went from Wentworth, so I walk by your campus a lot and wonder. Yeah, about it. yeah. Um, and it it um, I've heard really good things about it. I'd love to hear. Mm -hmm. We'd love to hear more. A lot of us are really interested in finding out how you folks are being educated, what you're thinking about, what your issues are, what where you think things are going. Um, and actually, I think we're done with this nomination stuff. And I'm wondering. Are we supposed to vote tonight? No, we don't vote. We vote on different. A different meeting. This gives everyone a chance to, to realize they've made a terrible mistake. Um, <laughs> Was, is anybody interested in uh, the positions of uh, vice president or uh, secretary? 
If you are, let me or Steve know. And you don't uh, have to do it. You don't have to do it in a public forum. Yeah, you got you got that. Um, so, Lauren, do you have? Um, could you tell us a little bit uh, in in hearing what Cynthia has been talking about in hearing about privacy issues? Have Have you and your fellow students been thinking or talking about this and about how it affects your future? Uh, okay. So we've we've been since of all this coronavirus, we started doing um, online classes or whatever, and. There's a mix between all my classes. Some people use Zoom, some people use GoToMeeting, some people use Teams. Um, I think what I've realized with all my classes that I think Zoom works the best just because I think the whiteboard is really good. As long it does have a lot of issues though when it comes to that, but I mean the fact that you can share screens and I'm in a computer science class so we can share um, our screens in like Eclipse and everything and people they can have access to um, use your screen and I, I just think that's the best but I mean when it comes to like all this I mean it's all brand new for us so I mean we're all kind of going with the flow at this point you know do, do you guys worry I've been told that your generation I don't know what you guys like to call yourselves your generation you young people or whatever but I've been told that you guys don't worry about this privacy stuff nearly as, as us 50 and 60 year olds is that true uh okay I'll compare myself to some of my friends because they're all they're not in computers or IT or anything they're all very like um med school students and I think a lot of them don't really care or notice as much of the privacy I want to say like I mean, on all my accounts and all my schools, I mean, I change my passwords and nonstop, like every three months, sometimes shorter. And I use, um, our school uses, what's it called? Two-factor. Two-factor, two yeah. Two. So we use that. But I know like, um, like my friends and a lot of people that I know don't, and they don't really care, or they'll have the same password for many things. And it's just so... <laughs> So I know. Happy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's what I'm saying. So I think so, it's different. Can I, can I um? Can I ask you, um, mm -hmm. when you're doing your passwords, you have these. You're being very careful with your passwords. Your fellow students aren't. How do you manage your passwords? Well, my dad uses LastPass, so we've all kind of used it. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I know some people that use <laughs> their notes on their phone. So, I mean, it's different. They lock it on their phones, but I don't think that makes a difference personally, but yeah. So, so do you have a family last pass that you all share? No. You, you each have your own account? Yeah. So I want to say a few words about this. Um, and I'd be really interested to hear from Cynthia if this has touched, been touched on by this emergency that you guys have been going through. Um, so uh, last pass is owned by LogMeIn. Um, a very large company that's based in Boston. It was purchased by them. They don't really care about it. They don't even talk to those people as far as I can tell. It's a money thing, but they put their name on it. Their um, and we had a customer that was had all their, their passwords in, in LastPass, and they had a password issue. They forgot the master password, and they went through the recovery sequence, which failed. And uh, we contacted them, and they said, well, we're sorry. You'll just have to recreate your password list. And it reminded me of this much larger issue, which I think affects both corporate situations and, and private situations, which is that we are now using a vast number of, quote, free services that are provided by companies like Google and LogMeIn and many, many others, where they're providing a service for free, which is pretty nice, or more or less for free. But there's a, there's a hidden problem with it. What they're doing is they're saying, take all your incredibly important private information, give it to us, and we trust us. We will take good care of it. And I, I'm, not, I'm not accusing these companies of misusing this information. What I'm accusing them from is creating a false sense of security. When you give somebody your passwords and they say, we'll take good care of your passwords, for me, there's an implied agreement there where you're saying, we will be responsible. If something goes wrong, we will help you. But in fact, when you sign up for these services, you check on these agreements that basically waive everything. These companies are not in any way responsible for anything. And so I've actually come to promote either using free open source software for passwords or a paid service where there's some kind of obligation on the services part to help you. And most paid services do go out of their way to be helpful. 
But I warn people about free services, and so I'll warn you about LastPass. I urge everyone who's using a program like this to export their passwords to a safe place, and we can talk about either in this meeting or another meeting what, a safe, what safe places there are to put this stuff, so that you have a copy of the important information that you need um, in an emergency. If the company goes belly up, if the patent, if you get locked out, which is even, which is much more likely. Uh, so um, in your in your case, I would definitely do that with last months. And uh, I would also want to want to make a plug here. And Cynthia, I'd be really curious about how this figures into the work that you've been doing. Passwords cut both ways. On the one hand, your law firm is very concerned for the security of your clients and your own security and making sure that people don't get in. But the flip side is also incredibly vital, which is what happens if one person has all the passwords and then that person disappears or dies or leaves or becomes an opponent to your organization or one of your clients' organizations. How do you make sure that you can get access to what these passwords give access to? Well, no one in, in my organization has pass, password access. I mean, we set our own passwords and if we don't remember them, we can't call the help desk and they give us a password. The password has to be reset. Uh, no one has a list of, of you know, 2,000 or 3,000 passwords um, for, for the firm. Uh, and that's just not, that's not the case. But what about the passwords that are outside? I understand that your administrator can reset a password. Mm -hmm. What no, happens no, no. to all the we different have services? Reset the password. Admin can't reset the password. We okay. don't call them and have them reset the They password. won't do anything. So you can reset the password by somehow authenticating yourself. Right. Uh, is that the way you handle all your outside vendors as well? So if you get locked out of a vendor's service, do you have to go through the password reset? You don't keep a list anywhere. You have to go through the password reset procedure. Uh, I don't have access. Those of us who are not um, a very limited group of people do not have access to vendor passwords. Well, how do you do and things like... How do you use Zoom? I mean, like, how do you use your services? We have single sign. Adam, can I interrupt a second? Yeah. Uh, Irina has her hand up. She's had it up patiently for some time. I really appreciate it. Um, Irina? No, I just wanted to note that um, I have seen examples how the young generation doesn't uh, have a, a proper idea of privacy. I actually um, was astonished when young medical professionals uh, started discussing my medical problems, not problems, my medical information, my private medical information, in front of a whole large group of complete strangers at Tufts Medical Center, I was like, wow, have you heard of HIPAA? Uh, behind me, I have a... Um, Mm, my agreement with um, a recruiting agency, which says that if you violate HIPAA, you can be fined two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. But it's in that case, I I was under the impression that these young people, they were in their twenties, they had not a slightest idea of this concept. I was astonished. Uh, so, just, is everyone familiar with what HIPAA is? I just want to, I'm just going to open a Word document here. Can everyone see this Word document? Can everyone see? We haven't opened it yet. Yeah, we can. Oh, I uh, know. You know, it's, it's, it's the way Zoom works. If you switch from one share to another, you can get a little muddle. Let's see, is that working? Yep, it's working. Can see? Okay, thank you. Well, so, I'm HIPAA. <coughs> Cynthia, do you want to say a few words about what HIPAA is and maybe address some of Irina's thoughts about it as well? Sure. Adam, can you let us see everybody, please, rather than the share? Yes. Um, I just want to make sure people see the spelling here. Has everyone got it? So, well, can you just tell us what it stands for? Uh, protection of personal uh, private information. It's, it, it actually means the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Um, and, and it doesn't apply as broadly as, as people tend to think it does um, to every 
single bit of, of health information. There's, um, there, it, granted, the, that people should not be discussing personal health information of an identifiable person in a public setting, but it may or may not be HIPAA covered. Um, it, it depends. Not, not all health information is, is HIPAA information in every setting. So it, it, it depends on the information and it depends on the setting. It restricts access to information, um, personal health information, protected health information um, under certain circumstances. It's really technical um, and it's, it's, kinda, it's not really in the scope of, of this meeting, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a law that covers health information, but it's not, it's not all health information. So I, I just want to make it clear that HIPAA doesn't cover everything. Uh, but it would probably the administration of, of Tufts Medical Center. Um, most likely, very I, I wouldn't want to comment on that. Yeah. Um, because I don't know the circumstances and I don't, and facts matter. So I, I wouldn't want to comment on that from a legal perspective. I do want to comment on LastPass though, on the discussion of free services. Yes, I, I, I think free services are exactly what you pay for them. Whether it's LastPass, whether it's Box, whether it's Dropbox, if it's free, it's what you pay for it, which is nothing. Um, if you expect a level of security with something that you're entrusting to um, a, a Box or a Dropbox or a LastPass, then pay for it, period. Um, and, and read the terms of service. Do you really, no, Cynthia, I'm sorry, but do you really expect us to read the terms of service? Uh, I kind of do. Yeah, I kind of expect every consumer to read a terms of service. I kind of do. I just find and, them. Or, or don't be surprised when something happens that are, is within the terms of service. I, I guess my expectation, we joke when we install software, we say your firstborn child now belongs to Microsoft. I, I think that when I look at those terms of service, they're always extremely one-sided and unreasonable. Um, and I guess my feeling about it as a computer professional, I don't read these terms of service, but I do try to have some sense of what my vulnerability is. And that's what I'm urging everyone here to do in thinking about these free services. I do want to suggest that a hybrid um, can be very effective. For example, we have a company that is an insurance company that needs to share a lot of passwords. So Cynthia, they're in a slightly different situation than your firm where you have single, you have like a single password that gives you access to everything you need. In their situation, they're required to be able to log in to multiple, many, many, many different company websites mm -hmm. because they're agents for many insurance companies. And it's just part of their, their legal requirement. They have to do it as part of their job. So we came up with a hybrid form between free and open source and the hybrid was we use a local program with an excellent reputation key paths that stores the, the um, passwords in a single file we then take that file and the file is impregnable it's got aes 256 encryption you could post it on the internet and it's not something you could in any reasonable technology could crack so you take that file and you put it in Dropbox, which is a low security sharing system. Then you have the different people in the different locations attached to that Dropbox and you use this file. But they're using it on their local machine. They're not in any way exposing that file to use by someone who breaks into Dropbox. And you have the benefit of Dropbox's uh, spread with the security of a local program. And I think that kind of hybrid solution may be something that, that are, is really helpful to all of us when we're struggling with this. So in moving forward through this epidemic, uh, pandemic, um, Cynthia, do you think that uh, people are gonna be working at home for a really long time? And you think, one of my customers who's a bond trader, he got on the phone, he was all excited. He said, you know what? We can do this. We've been having meetings with 70 people. We've been trading all the bonds. We're doing fine. You know what? We didn't need those offices. We don't need those high rise offices. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, when this crisis is over, you're gonna see a big change in the office market. 
all of us people who went home, we're going to stay home. Um, what do you think, Sophia? I, I, I think this. I think we're 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 going to see a, a real sea change in 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 the future of work. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a you know. I, I look, I, I think about my office and looking out at the, the landscape in, in Boston and thinking about all the new office buildings that are going up and thinking, wow, these could be really empty in a year or so. Um, they're really empty right now, but I mean, they could be really empty on a more permanent basis. Um, and, and frankly, as an owner of, you know, I'm a partner, so I'm, I'm, I'm part owner of this firm. I... I'd be kind of happy if we'd reduce our real estate exposure. So, um, yeah, I, I do think that we're about to see that this is going to set us up for a real change in the future of work. Um, people are realizing that companies are realizing that it can be done. Um, it's not, it's not an ideal situation for a number of companies just because People need to have interpersonal interaction, but I think you know once the, the the restriction of the pandemic is removed, and you can schedule time with for in person meetings, and you can travel again, and and that all changes. I I think we're going to see, I think we're going to see a difference. And but I think you know people need to be ready for this remote environment to be um, a long term thing. And from a security standpoint, as you're going forward after these tumultuous two weeks, what sort of broad changes do you see happening in, in how your clients are going to deal with their clients and how they deal with technology? What are some of the broad issues? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, security is, it, it's, a lot of my general counsel clients are thinking about it, but it's, it's like, it's way over to the side of, of the myriad of issues that they're dealing with in this, this environment right now. Um, I think it will start to bubble to the top and the overwhelmed IT folks, God bless them all, um, who have rolled out this new remote environment in two weeks when ordinarily it would have taken them months to do. Um, now we're suddenly going to start to turn to the, the you know, the blocking and tackling um, and their day to day of looking at logs and looking at anomalies and seeing, oh, excuse my French, shit, what, what is this? Um, we've been, you know, we've been under attack for the last week and a half and didn't realize it um, because we didn't have enough time and enough people. To, to look at this. I, I think we're, we will be coming into a phase where people start to realize and start looking at their environments and looking at anomalies and, and realizing that, that what they thought was normal is really an anomaly and there will be, you know, we're going to start to have numbers of reported incidents and, and breaches in addition to all the other crap we've got going on. I guess one of the questions I'm, I'm wondering about is, and may, I want to throw this maybe question over to everybody, is... Um, Arena has a comment, by the way. Just say again? Way. Irina has a comment or question. Irina? Go ahead, Irina. Thank you, Steve. Yes, Adam, I wanted to know your opinion and perhaps Cynthia's opinion, too, on this issue. You see, in the Russian cyberspace, People are talking right now about um, the human society, a global society, being transferred into what they call the digital matrix. You know, this what we are witnessing right now with these pandemics and blah, blah, blah. It really is a change, um, the transfer into this um, digital matrix when, where all the life, all the workforce will be online. What do you think of that? And it is really about the reduction of labor force, and it's, so, uh, it's also about the reduction of um, cost reduction and stuff like that. So um, and I, I, it is but, important for me to understand because I plan to take uh, certain certifications 
and maybe my uh, the job will not even exist anymore you know networking in, in the traditional sense what do you think of that so uh i I'll mean technical it. networking tech, like network plus so i i want to respond with a um a non-technical answer from, from my end and then definitely want to hear what cynthia has to say and what other people have to say I think this, this crisis that we're in, the pandemic crisis, is actually part of a much larger crisis that we've been in for a long time, where the question of, uh, and I want to um, make a reference, I'll, um, I'll put it uh, in the chat um, to everyone. Um, it's a book by Shoshana Feldman, um, who is now a, a retired professor, but when she wrote this, she was an up and coming professor. Uh, no, sorry. Um, Shoshana Zuboff, sorry. I think she spells it this way. It, it's called The Age of the Smart Machine and the Future, the Future of Work and Power. It's called The Age of the Smart Machine. Uh, the Future of Work and Power. Uh, and I think it's really relevant for our group. Uh, and we might even be up. Shoshana is local. She's a Harvard, retired Harvard professor. I would, it's wonderful if she could come and talk with us. Um, this is a very moving book. Uh, she was an academic professor when she wrote it, but it was actually, I, I think, uh, had, had the quality of a good novel. So what she did was she went into organizations before and after they had automated, before and after they had been, one of them was an insurance agency that did use paper files and then turned to cubicles and computerized technology. Uh, one was a, a, a bank and uh, the, one was a, um, a company that, that dealt with like ore retrieval. It was like an industrial company. And what I want people to read about when you look at this book or when we talk to um, this professor is this is a heartbreaking book. Um, when you read about these insurance, skilled insurance people who were eventually put in front of computers and told to handle their clients according to a fixed algorithm, they lost a lot of their touch. So that was one of the stories that came through. Another one that really stuck in my mind was the, the vice president of this Brazilian bank that computerized. And he smiled and he said, I'm vice president of this bank and I'm going to computerize it. That's my mandate and I'm going to do it. But I want to tell you something before we do it. My bankers, if you hand them a ledger, they will spot a forgery in five seconds. They won't be able to do it after you do this. So one thing I think we need as computer people to be leaders of is asking the tough question that the arena is asking. We ought to ask, what kind of society are we, are we creating? And if we leave it by itself, my observation is that it's like an unweeded garden, that um, a couple of weedy plants take over. Uh, I won't mention any names, but certain companies might take over and control the economy. Certain people might take over and control the political economy. I really urge us to take a strong role in creating a world for, um, for our children, um, for the people who are coming up, where they'll be able to do meaningful work that will really help people, and we'll have an economy that supports that. So I want to propose that as a, as a challenge for us as a, as a users group and as people. And, and then, Cynthia, do you want to weigh in on this as well? Whoa. That's really deep. I've been thinking about the future of work for some time and I have, I have clients that are, you know, in the um, artificial intelligence space, machine learning that, you know, could displace many people, many professionals in the, the technology world, not just, you know, line people or, but professionals in the technology world. And we do have to think carefully about that. I'm, I'm going to look at this, at this book. Thank you, Adam. That's, mm -hmm. a, that sounds like a great suggestion. Sounds like good. It sounds like good reading for right now. We have a, a big job ahead of us, I think. Um, so we were, we gathered here to talk about the one, one second. Excuse me a second. Yes. Um, Irina, was your uh, question answered? Um, yes, but not quite. Um, you see, you. since this is a technical networking group, I would like, um, what I would like, I learn here, and, and that's a big plus. 
but I would like to get a sense of direction. You know, of course, I, I, I attend I webinars you. and very high quality webinars, but I'm trying to understand, does it really make sense for me to get certified, to continue learning, you know, will I be able to get the job or? I think it's a great question. And I want to give my plumber answer. Um, I want everyone to raise your hand if you know a really good plumber who is sitting around without work right now. Not this week, not during the pandemic, but aside from the pandemic. Does anyone know any plumber like that? I don't know any plumber like that. So my advice to everyone, and it is part of my job to give job advice, is be indispensable. Um, do something that's really worthwhile, that people really appreciate, and learn to do it really, really well. Um, and um, like, uh, is, is Harry still with us? It looks like Harry left. But Harry teaches people, the, uh, unless I'm mix, mixing this up, Harry was teaching people the business side of, of architecture, I think. Right. Yeah. Was that Harry? Mm. When he introduced himself? He, he was teaching architecture students at Mass College of Art how to actually, um, no, it's not, it's Will Roberts. It's Will. So Will, so Will, what you're doing is also a critical function. So, and, and Irina, I think talking with Will and finding out about his course, it won't apply directly to you, but I think we all have to take responsibility for the business side of our work. So my advice to everyone about employment um, is, don't let someone else control your employment. And I want to tell you a weird story. So as I mentioned, I'm Jewish, and my ancestors came over on the boat to Ellis Island. And if you read Irving Howe's great book, um, uh, where he talked about people coming, my, my people coming to America, to Lower East Side, it was a very weird phenomenon. My ancestors were rabbis, um, scholars, philanthropists, industrialists. They were not peasants. They were people who worked really serious jobs over there in Eastern Europe. When they came to the United States, a lot of them became diamond merchants. They sold stuff. This doesn't make any sense. Why didn't they get jobs in the insurance industry? Why didn't they get jobs as middle management? They were qualified. They had the skills, their, their language skills um, were often excellent. It turns out there was a really good reason for it. They were really smart. And they recognized that there was rampant anti-Semitism in American corporations that if they tried to play golf with these people, they would never be accepted. And they said, look, if you sell something, it doesn't matter whether someone likes you or not, they want to buy the thing from you. And so one of the it, it, pieces of advice I give people is craft your profession so that people need what you have to offer, even if they don't like you very much, even if you're, you're not like your buddy buddy with them, uh, and find a way to be helpful to people, including people from a real diverse background, and make sure that the craft that you offer is not dependent on a particular class of people. So one of the ironies is people often ask me, you know, you're in the computer industry, why don't you have, you know, a yacht? Um, and the one reason is, I'm, there are all kinds of reasons, but one reason is that I intentionally did not want to practice that depended on rich people. Um, and so my advice to everyone from a business standpoint is diversify your practice, diversify. So if you, Irina, for example, suppose you get a lot of certifications and you go to work for a big company and one of Cynthia's clients figures out how to automate what you do. You're out on your ear and no one is going to care in that company. Like one of the problems is that compassion and loyalty and the sort of stuff that was much, much more prevalent in our society until recently does not exist. So my recommendation is try to create business relationships with people you actually know. Um, that, so I, does that answer a little bit, Irina? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Will, do you wanna come? Uh, yeah, I'm unmuted here. I just wanna, a uh, couple of things that struck me about that. Uh, at one point, my, um, my wife was working with the uh, resettlement program for a Jewish organization who were resettling Russian Jews. And we had people coming into the United States who had been lawyers, doctors, highly skilled professionals, but their skills did not translate into things that met United States standards. You couldn't just pick up and become a doctor here or become a lawyer here. 
yes. or even become a uh, new woman who had been a factory manager, plant manager, and the way they organized production in the old Soviet Union, you will make this, you will make that, doesn't, isn't the way American companies are managed. So the translation of skills is very important. I think the other thing I want to pick up on that you said, Adam, is uh, what happens in, in physical space? We're here in this kind of virtual meeting, which is wonderful, but a lot of stuff still goes on in the physical world. I just uh, had come in to me uh, in the last uh, couple of minutes a, um, a CNN story, and I'm going to try to, in the chat, post the uh, link to it. There it is. Um, that basically Verizon and Fios, they're not going to do any field installations. If your system breaks down in your house, they are not going to come into your house for the remainder of this situation. So wow. what do we do when we have parts of the physical world that we can't manage virtually in the computer world. Uh, and is, there's an awful lot to be said for some things that still have to remain and won't be virtualized. This is a really important question. And I, I really dispute this decision on Verizon's part. So I know in our company, we've gone to an emergency only house call policy, but it's an emergency only house call policy. So we're not going to, when a customer calls us, and we had a customer call us the other day, his computer was falling apart, and we delivered one of our clinic computers to him. We did it with social distancing, um, but it worked. It was a very effective, successful transaction. I can easily, my landlord had to come to my house because the roof was leaking. I, we ranged, so I was at least six feet away the entire time he was working. It is possible to do this kind of work with, so, with good social distancing um, to have hygienic processes before and after. Well, I think, if, I think if you read the Verizon release, they said they are going to deal with emergency situations. But the fact that you can't get HBO is not an emergency. Well, but if I can't get it on the internet, that uh, may I be an emergency. Yes, Steve, do you have a comment? Steve Provost? It, it, it's just surprising that you guys are just talking about this because I just got a call from one of our uh, our Tuesday class members who's having an issue with um, not having internet this time. And Will just posted that particular thing, which answers the question, because I was going to actually help uh, call him and talk to him over the phone when we're not in this particular you know, area and help him out with his phone and without with his internet. So I'm thankful that he just posted this when he did, because I was going to help him with his, his internet. But now that uh, Comcast is not going to help him, you know, get his internet back because he needs to get in, have that internet for his for the class. Well, the good news about service these services, a uh, little less with BIOS, but certainly with Comcast, is that delivery services. There's social distancing delivery services. People are delivering stuff. So if something goes wrong with Comcast, it's usually your device. It's usually not the cabling. It's very rare, very rare. Once the cabling's in place, for there to be a problem. So if somebody's modem breaks, you can order another modem. And, and Martin and I have talked extensively about backing up your equipment. So I think this is a good moment to say to our group and also to our larger culture, having backup stuff is really, really helpful. And I urge people to think about this. Um, think about what would happen if your modem died. Uh, it, and now, because of the delays and issues, this is going to be a harder, a harder problem. And so I do want to say a few words about uh, I do want to say a few words about uh, this issue of illness. This pandemic is partly a logistical nightmare, but it's also a very real nightmare for people. People are really genuinely getting sick, um, and some people are dying. Um, and I want to point out that, uh, and I'd be very curious to see how this plays out, Cynthia, in your practice. Um, in my practice, a lot of our customers run their own businesses of one kind or another. And they often hold a lot of stuff in their heads. If they died or became incapacitated, it could cause a lot of trouble to a lot of people. And so one of the things I wanna urge people to think about as you're helping your customers is to make it part of your practice to help people prepare for an event like that. And I wanna point out that our profession is unusually well positioned to do so. One of our stock and trade is password management. If we can help people have good password management, 
So they can then give their password safely to a person if they're sick and that person can get into stuff, it can make a huge difference. So I really urge people to be thinking about that. Cynthia, do you want to comment on that and how that plays out in your practice? Yeah, we see, we're starting to, to see these issues, especially with our, our startup companies that we're working with, where there's, there's most of the institutional knowledge resides with the founder or with one or two founders. Um, and we're starting to encourage founders to ensure that their, um, their knowledge base is either uploaded to you know a, a secure cloud server provider service provider or that their their knowledge base is recorded somewhere um so that you know in the unfortunate event that that one or more of them were to fall victim to this that that the company could continue um in its you know in its current state um and and lots of we're, we're starting to see investors inquire into this um, because we we represent a, a lot of startup companies but startup companies that are still in search of investors and and financings uh, and and that is becoming a question in in financing interviews and and some of the diligence discussions is what's your succession what's the planning what is what is your disaster recovery plan in the event that that one of you goes down that's amazing. And, and are people responding well? Are your customers your no. responding well to that? No. <laughs> no, they're not responding well. Um, if you've worked with startups and you've worked with incredibly brilliant founders of, of companies, they don't react well to that. Because they think they're indestructible or because they just feel it's impractical? They just feel it's impractical. They don't. They don't feel they're they're indestructible. They just feel that that this kind of of backup is uh, is impractical. Well, I'm curious about this. I, I mean, I'm just thinking. Say Jeff. I think his name is Jeff Yuan, who's the founder of Zoom. Yeah. Uh, is it Eric or Jefferson? Um, so, I, can you give us some flavor of how one would upload your brain in that way? Like what? Well, well, a public company like a Zoom, they have to have contingency planning. They have to, um, and it's disclosed in their in their publicly filed documents that they have contingency planning. They have, you know, they they've got backups for backups for backups for backups for their executive suite. Um, they are not reliant on a single individual. They they wouldn't have a publicly traded company if they were. I see. So, so even though like Google's character is very influenced by the two founders, if they departed, yeah. Google yeah. set up their way. Google would still be Google would still be Google. Yeah. Steve, do you have a comment? And then Will. I'm just mentioning that um, my organization, Boston Project Rebound Financial Services, is actually a um, of. We've only been around since 28. The later half of 2018, and still. Uh, just a little over a year old and you know we you know I'm glad that Cynthia mentioned that because I know that we're still fighting with you know trying to get our our uh, policies and procedures in place and it's been an awful hard time and fight just to get that stuff in place and um, you know I, I'd love to hear uh, get meet with Cynthia off off record and see if, what she can do to help my organization uh, in a lot of the stuff that she's been mentioning throughout tonight. I, I, I second that. I mean, I really think that, I just want to emphasize, I think our role as computer people includes dealing with this succession issue. I think we're first responders on this issue, and we should take some responsibility to help our customers recognize how important it is. Will? Uh, uh, in, the, in the class I teach, which is management, for people running an architectural firm, and most of these firms are not public companies. And many of the firms are built around the talents of one individual or two individuals. And so this issue of succession is quite important. Difficult to talk to, to a bunch of 20 somethings who are in graduate school who are just beginning their career. And I tell them, you ought to think about it because not only is it to the end of your career, but what about your boss or your boss's boss? What's going to happen to your firm? 
uh, when that principle is no longer there as the sort of star of the whole thing. Uh, there's been quite a bit written about looking at different firms, some of which continue, and we see firms that have architects' names on them. The, the architect died 30 years ago, and the firm is still uh, continuing and has a style. We have other firms that the minute the principal dies, the firm disbands, it never gets its footing again. So it's very, very important to think about, and it's very difficult to discuss. It's like discussing death with your own parents. Uh, it's not a pleasant conversation, but it's one that needs to be had. And uh, I don't know where uh, the IT and uh, data professionals come into this, but an awful lot of what people are these days becomes in, uh, in contained within their digital footprint. Files they save, things they have access to, things they know about, contact lists, goes on and on and on. Thank you, that's really helpful. Martin, do you wanna add? Um, one thing I'm um, trying to bring up with clients, although many clients don't even bother to keep track of their passwords, um, but I'm at least writing about it in my newsletter uh, and talking with folks like Adam about this, is the password chart. You know, while it's not everything that you're talking about, it's often, as Adam likes to say, the keys to the kingdom. You know, whether it's banking or credit cards or retirement funds or corporate level stuff or business level stuff, um, you know, the, the idea that um, if you can, A, keep track of your passwords, which is good for you in, 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 while you're alive, but B, if you become disabled or die, whoever is either managing your affairs while you're alive and, and perhaps incapacitated or after you die, would be, it was a huge, it'd be a huge boon to have your current passwords, or at least a reasonable facsimile thereof, because, you know, to reset everything is a huge chore. Um, or to get Comcast to give you access requires a death certificate and finding the right department, et cetera, et cetera. So having some idea of whether you call it succession or good record keeping or um, the executor having a copy or at least knowing where to get the copy um, of your password chart um, is at least a start in, in partly having the conversation, but it also you know, um, uh, can be a little less um, uh, emotionally upsetting than talking about all of the consequences of your dropping dead or becoming disabled. My dad was a life insurance salesman, so I grew up with, you know, talk about wills and trusts and power of attorneys. Not that I really understood them, but I was, I, I, I don't know if other people have this experience with their parents' professions, but I was relatively comfortable <laughs> with, you know, dad bringing this up from time to time, um, not to mention, you know, chatting about his work. Uh, and actually, right. ironically, now I actually work with a number of insurance agents. So I, I can relate to them pretty well, um, not about the, the death issue directly, but at least. Uh, Karen has a question. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, Karen. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Uh, um, yeah, I was. It's delayed. Actually, hold on. I muted the wrong one. One sec. Go ahead. Karen. I had muted her. I'd taken care of the muting. Um, can you hear me? There really we well. Go. go ahead. Okay. Um, I was saying that I think the exit plan is a lot like, it is um, much like developing your own mm -hmm. business plan. It's your plan A, B, or C, like your plan A is this is my business. Plan B is, well, what do we do next? And um, I don't know. I don't know what you say when somebody dies, but Maybe it would be plan C of, well, you've got all of your um, passwords together because there is that, you, you, I, Cynthia, I, I, um, I don't know where to go with that, that thought except, except I was um, very surprised that Cynthia said that there were a lot of people saying that they didn't really want to do, you know, they didn't want to address what to do, um, all of that. Um, it shocks me. But that's why. I, I, I mean, it's kind of obvious. There are, there are many people who don't have basic estate planning documents. I mean, I know, I know, I know people who don't have a will 
never mind a business plan for succession. So I don't think that should be surprising to anybody. I guess I don't like to talk about that. We're, we're, we're shocked, but not surprised. Or something. Yeah. yeah. Not, 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 yeah. You see it firsthand. That's all. Yes. So I, I, we should wrap up in, in a moment or two, but I, I want to say to, to, I usually like going forward from a meeting with a bit of a mission. Uh, I want to urge everyone to take this conversation really seriously. I think we covered a lot of different ground um, and some of the, the basics of making sure that we're using Zoom and other programs responsibly and helping our customers do that. And I think the issue we got, we've gotten to at the end here is a much larger issue that goes beyond the pandemic, which is we're actually more important than we think. I, I think, um, I think the, um, there's a, when in some ways computer people have been thought of as being, well, you know, they're just these computer people that are sort of part of society. Our, our computer stuff has gotten so woven into our society so that now, I think the thing that I finally realized this was I was at a, I was at a gas station and the gas pump rebooted into Microsoft Windows. <laughs> and I just realized, oh my God, it's everywhere. <laughs> it's in the intensive care ward, it's everywhere. And that actually puts us in a position of great responsibility and, and Lauren even more, um, because you and your friends and your colleagues are gonna be responsible for the mess that, that is, is, is here. We, I want us to work on this. Um, so that Lauren and their and her colleagues have an easier time, um, and that and I also want to emphasize the attitude that Cynthia is referring to in the people who are running these startups is actually an attitude that is I, the sociologists would call this modal, a modal attitude in the computer business. Modal means something you see over and over, so it becomes almost a theme. The computer business is filled with superstars, people who invented some amazing thing. They're now incredibly rich. They 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 use computerized dating services, whatever. Um, this is very opposite of what a lot of us were raised in. The, a lot of the people here, and I know a lot, I know a lot of people here very well, we were raised in a computer world that was really different, where helping other people was really the really key issue, where um, loyalty and connection was really important. The ethic of you're a computer person, someone's emailing you with a problem, you, you go out there and help them. This is contrary to the ethic that I think is very dominant in our media and very dominant in the way a lot of our computer companies work. If you see the way these large companies treat their customers on a one-to-one -one basis, I get really, really angry. And so I really want to change the computer business and I hope that we'll all play a role in this. Um, I want us to, to go back to this community-oriented attitude. And that includes if you're running a good, important company. These people who are running these companies don't think of themselves as being social actors, except in like a 10% donation sort of way. They don't realize that what they're doing is they're really a binding, bound in part of our social community. And we, we are older and we do realize this. And so I think we need to teach it and help it. So in a very local level, us being aware of these end of life issues, especially in the pandemic, us being aware of incapacitation issues, us being aware that we are important social actors I just want us to bear that in mind. And uh, I want to thank everybody for coming and joining in. And Cynthia, for being our guest host, thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. You're welcome. It was an interesting discussion. Um, so we'll meet again on Zoom next month. We'll send out notices. We really encourage people to come to our board meeting um, and help shape things. I do want people to think about volunteering to be outreach coordinators and development coordinators. And um, this meeting has been recorded. Um, and I also want to mention that um, our company is sponsoring an online clinic that helps refurbish computers for people who can't afford them. And we are delivering in the emergency. We're delivering computers to people and refurbishing them remotely. So if people want to participate that, in that, please let me know. Um, and uh, so just thank you all very much for coming. Um, Steve, can you um, unmute people so people can chat with each other? Just uh, a quick note. Uh, tomorrow I'll be on probably about an hour, just about an hour to half hour before the actual computer clinic starts. So people can kind of get work out the bugs in their uh, Zoom broadcast, either with video or mute. So 
Very I'll kind of you, Steve. Early. Thank you. Uh, please clean up around you. You know, just put any litter away that you find. And I'm trying to clean up. Miss the potluck. <laughs> I miss it too. <laughs> I found this pizza add-on for Zoom, but I'm not sure how to get it to work. <laughs> <laughs> you got to cut it a little a smaller than 18 slices to get it through the internet. <laughs> um, Lauren, if you would um, put your uh, contact info in the chat, then we can be in touch with you. And also, any any other any uh, anyone else is new and you haven't signed up for the Bina mailing list, I really encourage you to do that by going to bina.org. Yeah, Adam needs your dues. We spoke your name. Hey, there's 24 of us. How are we going to get that pizza through the uh, internet? It's not easy. No one said this was going to be easy, Steve, but we, we believe in you. Very I've small pizza, slice. Right? I've got this ability to really infuse electrons of pizza, so I'm happy to share. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. It's great to see you all. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Take care. Good night. Bye, everybody. Good Stay night. Happy. Thank you, Cynthia. Cynthia? Adam? Yeah. Adam, you still there? I'm here. Yeah, I just uh, sent you a message. Um, of a potential venue for your uh, PCs. Ah, your right yeah, contact the um, City of Boston um, Neighborhood Services. The Department of Neighborhood Services? Yeah, the Department of Neighborhood Services because there's a lot of people, uh, low-income people, that um, really could use a PC but don't have one, and um, they can't afford it. And with um, all this remote learning now, uh, a lot of people, they have to go to the library, you know, they have to get their kids to the library, or they have to get their, their kid and their laptop to a coffee shop to do their homework. Um, Adam, in that vein, um uh, if you look at the list of essential services in the governor's um, uh, website press release, I can send you the link. At the, you scroll all the way to the bottom, um, there's an application um, to say, can my business be declared an essential service if it's not one of the ones listed above? Okay, Steve. Um, and maybe, you know, Charissa's logic is a, a way to, you know, push the, at least the clinic element. <laughs> it's really interesting. I, I think in some ways being an essential service <laughs> Um, I think one of the effects of that is allows people to meet in person because it's an emergency. I guess um, my feeling about it is that um, is that I'm quite, quite happy not to be an essential service. Um, I hope we'll be a, a service in operation. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm trying to set a bit of an example um, of showing how you can keep doing stuff um, and just have and you can try to be creative. Um, and find ways of doing stuff under these difficult circumstances. Uh, but I do, I do agree with you. And there, there have been grant, there are grants for businesses that are suspended. And I really urge people when it makes sense to apply for those. Sharice, um, um, I wanted to suggest, if you wouldn't mind, could you let them know about us? Could you tell them about our clinic? I have to drill into the city hall and figure out which office it is, but shouldn't be a big deal. Yeah, I, I think maybe you let them maybe know now is not a really good time to do that. Do you, think? you can't go in no. Person. No, you're you're talking virtually, right? Virtually, call them. Yeah. Um. Um. Good. So, um, Marty and Lauren, um, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Great to have you. So, uh, Lauren, I'll be in, we'll be in touch about outreach stuff. And okay. Looking, learn, looking forward to learning more about what you, what you all are studying and whether your computer science professors are teaching you the correct things or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Hi, Steve. And, um, and the other outreach person. I'd um, like to touch base with you just so we can uh, knock heads together and see what we come up with for 
uh, some stuff we might want to do for outreach. Okay, sounds good. Great. So, and about computer security. What's that, Cherise? And teaching about computer security, the importance of computer security. Yeah. <laughs> Sharice, it seems like you're talking very close to the microphone and uh, you're coming across. I'm not. Muffled. You're not? Okay. I'm not. All right, well, what do I know? I'm just saying you're coming across kind of muffled. That's all. We can still understand. Yeah, that. well, the microphone is in my headset and one of the speakers. Got it. Yeah, and this issue, I've had to deal with this issue in so many ways about how people sound, how people look. But I want to tell you about a lovely coincidence. I'm in this Jewish men's group where we were, were making a video invitation to the larger group. And so I was standing here with my, the window. I had Martin hadn't helped me with, yet. And so I had my, my bright window in the back. And they were saying, basically, Adam, you look awful. So what I did was I, I moved my camera and I swiveled it to point to the wall over here. I'm going to do this for you to show you what, you, what you'll see. So I, I swiveled it over to do this wall and I went over and stood over there. And that photograph that you see, that's my father, Richard, when he was six years old. And he's now 97 and he's alive and kicking. He went through um, the Great Depression, World War II. He was on a, a ship that was attacked by kamikaze pilots. And he was one of the first people to land on Nagasaki after the bomb had been dropped. And he came back being incredibly worried about what was going to happen to us and what, what nuclear war meant. And got really involved in civil defense issues. Uh, and it had a big, it had a big effect on me. Um, but what had an even bigger effect was because this is this person who is just filled with, and is filled with energy and caring for other people. And um, a, a true community member. So I, I was really delighted that when I swiveled my camera, I got, I got to, people could see my dad. So the Zoom revolution has some really positive points. His name is Richard. All righty then. Well, thank you all. Well, pleasure to meet you, Richard Frost. <laughs> thank you very much, Denise. I'll pass that off. I hope everyone has a lovely evening. I'll leave the meeting running in case people want to chat. Uh, and I'll see you all soon. Bye, bye, Adam.